entrepreneurs of the world. I'm Stelios Katsakis, CEO of One Business World. Leading Entrepreneurs of the World features entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders presenting on cutting edge topics and the latest industry developments. Our goal is to provide the global business and entrepreneurial communities with a window into the minds of those who are shaping the future of the world. Today, we're very pleased and honored to welcome leading entrepreneur, investor, speaker, author, mentor, Stephen Hoffman. Steve Hoffman, or Captain Hoff as he's called in Silicon Valley, is the captain and CEO of Founderspace, one of the world's leading startup accelerators. He's also a venture investor, serial entrepreneur, and author of several award-winning books. These include Make Elephants Fly and Surviving a Startup and The Five Forces That Change Everything, which is about to be released. Steve was founder and chairman of the Producers Guild Silicon Valley chapter, served on the board of governors of the New Media Council, and was a founding member of the Academy of Television's Interactive Media Group. While in Hollywood, Steve worked as a TV development executive at Fry's Entertainment, known for producing over 100 TV shows acquired by MGM. He went on to pioneer interactive television with his venture-funded startup, Spider Dance, which produced interactive TV shows with NBC, MTV, Turner, Warner Brothers, History Channel, Game Show Network, and others. In Silicon Valley, Steve founded two more venture-backed startups in the areas of games and entertainment and worked as a mobile studio head for Infospace with such hit mobile games as Tetris, Wheel of Fortune, Tomb Raider, Thief, Hitman, Skee-Ball, and X-Files. Captain Hoff launched Founder Space with the mission to educate and accelerate entrepreneurs. Founder Space has become one of the top startup accelerators in the world. Steve has trained hundreds of startup founders and corporate executives in the art of innovation and provided consulting to many of the world's largest corporations, including Qualcomm, Huawei, Bosch, Intel, Disney, Warner Brothers, NBC, Gulf Oil, Siemens, and Viacom. Captain Hoff, it is a great pleasure and an honor to have you here with us today to hear more on the very interesting and very important topic of surviving a startup. Thank you, and welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. Wonderful to be here, Stelios. It is my honor to be part of One Business World and to be talking to all of you. Today, I am going to go in depth on my new book, which was just released by HarperCollins called Surviving a Startup. And it is about everything entrepreneurs need to know to raise venture capital, grow their businesses, and most importantly, to overcome those obstacles you hit, those obstacles that end up killing over 90% of startups. So doing a startup is really hard. You know, 10% or so succeed. And of that 10%, only a fraction become the unicorns we all talk about. So we, it seems like every other startup is a unicorn, but what you don't see is all the startups that tried and didn't make it there. I actually run Founderspace, which is a global startup accelerator. So I work with hundreds of entrepreneurs every year all around the world, helping them solve their problems, helping them rethink their business models, helping them do business deals and get the capital they need to get to the next level. Now, I'm going to give you some of the tips that I have learned doing this, and I'm going to talk about the mindset you need to have and the strategies you need to employ to make a successful business. And most importantly, I'll talk about some of the pitfalls, the mistakes that entrepreneurs make. And I know about these because I have been an entrepreneur. I did a number of my own venture funded startups. I did two bootstrapped companies and my experience working with top entrepreneurs all over the world has really given me insights into what entrepreneurs need to know when they are starting out growing their companies. So with no further ado, uh, let me dive into my presentation. Let 
One moment. Maybe that wasn't working. Steve, it looks good when you share the screen and then you just click the, uh, the slideshow. Yeah, I know. It's not clicking for some reason. Oh, there. <laughs> Got it. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Founder Space has been around for two decades. We have been one of the early incubators and accelerators in Silicon Valley. And this has given us a chance to evolve as the entire startup ecosystem has evolved. You know, over the years, we have worked with all types of startups. So we are broadly focused. We work with startups in almost every sector, but most of the startups we work with tend to be software startups internet startups, mobile startups, startups using the latest technology, both software and hardware to really change the business and consumer landscape. Now, Founder Space is, operates all over the world. We have over 50 partners in 22 countries. And prior to the pandemic, I was traveling 70% of my time working with our partners in different countries. And those partners tend to be other incubators and accelerators, technology centers, universities, governments, and large corporations. And we bring them all together into our startup ecosystem to really help train the entrepreneurs and also give the entrepreneurs opportunities. We've actually done a lot of work in Asia. We work very closely with the South Korean government and have run many programs there. We, wor we worked in Taiwan extensively and also in China. So in China, we have incubators in many of the major cities, including Hangzhou, right outside Shenzhen, Xi'an, Nanjing, other cities in China. And we have a big presence there, not just on the ground with our own incubators, but also tapping into venture capital. So we help startups from all over the world when they want to enter the US market and obtain capital in Silicon Valley, which is my hometown, or when they want to go to Asia and specifically China because there's so such a big opportunity there to grow companies. Now, Founder Space has been ranked as the number one accelerator for overseas startups by Forbes Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine, and Inc. Magazine put us in the top 10 of all incubators. So we have really worked hard to build a global organization where people from different countries actually help one another succeed, especially when they enter those markets. I'm the author of two books. So my first book, Make Elephants Fly, is an award-winning book that goes into detail on the process of radical innovation. It tells how the top startups in the world innovate, what they do to actually take it from their idea stage, which is that elephant that seems so big and so impossible to get off the ground that it will never fly and actually get it to fly, to take off. And then my new book, which just came out, Surviving a Startup, which is all about the tools, strategies, and ideas entrepreneurs need to actually get their business to the next level. In today's talk, Startup Survival Guide, I'm going to go into a few of the areas that I think are important for you to know as an entrepreneur so that when you hit those obstacles, you can overcome them. The first thing you need to know is your mindset. And that is that it is never easy. I will tell you, Every time I did one of my own venture funded startups, there was a point where I was on the ground, exhausted, couldn't imagine going forward, seeing no hope and no way out. Yet, every time I had to pick myself up and keep going because that's what entrepreneurs do. So perseverance, the idea that you can keep going even when it might seem hopeless, even when you're out of energy, even when you're out of money, you just keep going. It's an essential trait for entrepreneurs. Because I will tell you, we read all the stories online about, how, about the big successes, and it seems so easy. It seems like it just happened magically. 
But from every experience I've had and every experience I've shared with other entrepreneurs, there are always points along the journey where it's not easy. So you have to change your mindset from this is going to be an easy, quick money thing. I'm just going to walk into it and it's going to take off to this is something I have to really apply myself to, something I need to figure out, something that is going to challenge me and see if I'm up to the test. Take these obstacles you face in your business, not as negative events, but as positive challenges. They are challenges for you to prove yourself. They're opportunities for you to step up to the plate as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, and prove you can do it. If you can overcome these, then you deserve to be an entrepreneur and you deserve to be a success. If you can't, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. Honestly, being an entrepreneur is not for everybody. I tell entrepreneurs this. They ask me, you know, should I be an entrepreneur? I say, ask yourself because it isn't easy. You're going to struggle. It's going to be really hard. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you've got to be the type of person who can handle stress, who can uh, take a lot of pain along the way and still go on. I mean, just talk to somebody like Elon Musk. I mean, he, he even admitted he was totally stressed out and he's somebody who can handle stress. So you can imagine if you are not the type of person who likes stress, if you're not the type of person who likes uncertainty, then the challenge of being an entrepreneur is really tough. You may not be able to do it. And there are other jobs out there and other paths that you can follow. The, the easiest one, if you still want to be in the startup space, is find a company, a startup that you believe in, you believe in the management team and join that because at least all the stress isn't upon you. So I tell a lot of people who are looking to be in startups, know yourself. That's the most important thing before you do anything else and know what's right for you. You know, what role in the company is right for you, not what you want to do, but what's right for your personality and your capabilities. Don't fear death. If you are afraid that your startup will fail, then you will not make the right decisions and you will actually increase the chance of failure. The, the entrepreneurs who try to cut risk, who try not, who don't want to take chances because they don't want to, to end up bankrupt, you know, with a failure on their hand, those are the ones who inevitably wind up uh, going the wrong direction. So I want to tell you, being in a startup means high risk. If you want to be the type of startup that venture capitalists fund, the type that grows exponentially, you know, and really has a big impact on the world, then you are going to need to take proportional risk, which means big risk. If you try to scale down that risk, you are automatically crippling your startup. Yes, you think you might not be taking the risk, but you're also, risk means the potential to grow quickly. Risk means doing something nobody has done before and doing it in a big way, in a better way that allows you to position your company as a market leader. So when you go into the startup, instead of trying not to take risks, you should look at what risks are most important to the growth and future of your company and you should take them. You should take the leap. Don't hold back. Think again, I'm going to refer to Elon Musk because he's always in the news. Um, Elon Musk, you know, he didn't say, I want to start a company that launches satellites into space. No, he said, I want to take humanity to Mars. What bigger risk could you take with a startup? I mean, every scientist at the time that he launched SpaceX, said, that's impossible. You're, you know, are you crazy? It's, it's never going to work. You know we, we, you know, we haven't even put a person on the moon in, in a long, long time. How are we going to get them to Mars? But in you're a private company. You're not a government with billions of dollars at your disposal. But he didn't care. Like he said, we're going all the way. This is what we're doing. Same when he started Tesla. Um, and he wasn't the founder, by the way. There were two other founders. He was an angel investor. But when he took over Tesla from the founders and decided that he would make it into the number one 
automobile company in the United States, and he would do it being electric, even though there was no infrastructure for electric cars, even though the, uh, an independent automobile maker in the United States hadn't succeeded in over 40 years, he was going to take that risk. So when you're doing it, when you're doing your startup, don't scale down your idea. Think big. Think about what you can do that will have an oversized impact that will really change not just the world, but how people think, how people live, everything, and then go for it. Don't fool yourself. Now, this is another thing. I'm telling you to take big risks, to do big things, but at the same time uh, that you dream big, you have to be very practical. So a lot of entrepreneurs will put blinders on. In, in essence, we all are biased. We are biased and our biases tend to, we want to confirm our existing beliefs. So if we believe in our startup, a lot of times we will discard information that is contradictory to what we want to believe. And, and that, you know, you, you have this big dream, you want to go to Mars or you want to, you know, change how energy is consumed. You want to do something that's going to have a big impact and you have all these ideas around it. Well, having the ideas and having the vision is great, but at the same time, you need to really clearly see what's happening in front of you. And if you get data, if you get feedback that this technology that you're developing just won't work, you can't ignore that. Like if you ignore that and keep raising money, you will wind up like that startup Theranos. You know, Theranos, uh, ha, you know, wanted to believe that they could have this incredible technology, medical technology that would change how people live, but their technology never worked. It never worked. Yet they kept ignoring the facts and pushing further until they eventually crossed the line and committed fraud. And, and that company just imploded. In your startup, most entrepreneurs don't face some, something that big, but they do uh, block out information. For example, when they have an early version of their product and take it to customers, customers, you know, you have to listen to your customer. And if your customers start telling you, look, this, you know, I don't want this, or I don't need this, or it doesn't do what I need, but you say, no, 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 you just don't get it. You don't see the vision and you ignore your customers, then you are fooling yourself. You are fooling yourself because at the end of the day, your customer isn't going to design your product, but your customer is going to use your product. And if your product doesn't meet their needs, if it doesn't give them what they, what they really want, then nobody is going to buy it. And I have seen this over and over and over again with startups and with big corporations, they will bring a product to market. Um, they will go out early to the customers. The customers will not be excited about this, yet they will ignore that and keep pushing forward because they want to believe this will work instead of taking a hard look and either totally changing the product, pivoting their company or doing a complete restart. Don't fool yourself. Ask for help. A lot of entrepreneurs have a big ego. A lot of entrepreneurs believe they can do everything. Well, let me tell you, nobody can do everything. And the smartest entrepreneurs, the ones who really end up being successful are the ones who humble themselves, ask for help, and really take the advice they're given. So if you want to maximize your chance of success, it's not to live in a bubble. It's not to always be right. The best way to be successful is to always be asking other people their opinions about what you're doing. And then you don't have to believe everybody, but start use each one as a data point and start to add them up and look at them. When you're in trouble, when your business isn't quite working, the most important thing you can do is not hunker down and continue working on your product. The most important thing you can do is go out and ask for help. Get experienced people in your field involved in your product. Get them, if you have to give them shares, if you have to give them money, if they just wanna help you, you must get them involved at an early stage. You need sounding boards, people 
who aren't so immersed in your world that they can see things from a different perspective. They can see things without being emotionally attached to them. This is really important. You want to see your product and your business through other people's eyes, through their vast experience that may be totally different than yours so that you can start to see paths that open up opportunities that you are blind to right now. And remember, whatever you're blind to, you're blind to, you don't even know it exists. So the only way to see it is to get advisors around you. I tell every startup at an early stage, get a trusted group, a board of advisors that you can go to on a regular basis, preferably every month, and actually lay out honestly with them. You have to be totally honest and transparent. All the biggest problems you have and ask them what they would do in that situation. You should also, in addition to a board of advisors, which are experts who have been entrepreneurs and investors and, and people in, in your domain that have a deep knowledge of your field, those people are really important. The other group board of advisors you should have, a separate one, is your customers. You should literally be meeting with your customers all the time and not trying to sell them something, not trying to convince them that your product is the greatest. But these, but asking them, where should we be going? Are we meeting the needs? Are we missing any opportunities? Are we seeing every, everything we should be seeing? Using them as consultants, not just customers. And then the last one is ask for help from your employees. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. Asking for help does not mean you don't know what to do. Asking for help is getting them involved, getting them engaged in your company. Your employees should also feel like they are making the decisions with you, and at least you are listening to their point of view. Whether you always take their advice is another thing. You don't have to. You're getting all these different inputs. Great CEOs gather as much data from as many sources as possible. You should be doing the same thing. This is critical to your business. Get your team on board. So when you're doing a startup, don't try to do everything yourself. Don't try to make all the hard decisions yourself. Honestly, great CEOs, great leaders of teams actually get their teams to make the decisions for them. And I have a rule. It's, it's, a, it's a rule that I've seen work over and over again for management. And it's a very simple rule. My rule is ask, don't tell. What do I mean by this? I mean, when you are engaging team members, instead of telling them what to do every day, instead of coming into the office and saying, you do this, you do that. No, 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 don't do that. Um, you, instead of doing that, you go into your office and you ask them, what should we be doing? What are your, the priorities? What, what do you think you should be working on next? Ask your employees to tell you what they should be doing. First of all, it gives them ownership. They aren't just taking orders from you. They are actually uh, the boss of themselves. Secondly, it gets them to commit. So if you tell an employee to do something that they think shouldn't be done, isn't a priority, or is kind of a stupid idea, they'll do it, but half-heartedly. However, if you ask them what they should be doing, and they tell you, oh, I, I should be doing this, then it's them saying they should do it. They feel much more empowered, much more invested in doing that. And then if you ask them, when do you think you can get it done by? Will you set the goals? What's the timeline? Once they come and commit to those, to you, they feel motivated that they have to live up to what they did. And honestly, if you don't if you don't agree with your employee, if you think that they're going off in the wrong direction, instead of telling them, no, 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 I've done this a thousand times, don't do it that way. Hold back and instead ask them, why are you doing this this way? Um, I, you, know, you can share your experience of what you've experienced. How, do you, how are you gonna overcome this obstacle? You will all of a sudden turn on the light bulbs and get them to start thinking. They will become your partners in the business. And by setting them on this course, they will be off and running on their own. And you 
won't have to worry about their problems because they are the ones who are going to be solving them and coming to you with solution. So get your team on board right from the beginning. Always delegate authority, ask, don't tell. I like to say only the best survive. So this is really important to understand. In the world of technology and in the world of business, usually the largest best positioned company with the best solution will crush everybody else. Now, why is this? Why is there like one search engine that we all go to, Google, um, and all these other search engines are struggling or they don't exist anymore? You know, when Google started, they weren't the first search engine. There were 19 other established search engines that were way ahead of them. But Google came up with the best technology, their page ranking algorithm, that delivered superior results to everybody else. And you know what happened? Almost none of those companies exist today. YouTube, the same thing. There are lots of YouTube clones out there. Crush them all. Facebook, you know, uh, you know, they're this giant of a social network. In each domain, um, certain startups, the winner takes everything. Now, why is this? First of all, think about it. It's pretty simple. When you are picking a product to use, why would you use the second best? Almost nobody would use the second best product. There's no reason. You would always go to the best one. In addition to this, in technology space, there's what we call the network effect. That means the more people that use a product, often the better that product becomes. Think of Amazon, this huge giant of an online retailer. They are so powerful and so hard to displace because as a buyer, when I go onto Amazon, they give me a lot of choices. There's a lot of sellers there with, and there's reviews and everything else. So I can very quickly get the best deal and determine which is the best product for my needs. Now, if I'm a seller, at the, because there's so many buyers on there, that's the best place for me to sell. So it attracts more sellers and more buyers, and it's a virtuous circle. They keep adding more. It becomes very, this network effect means that the, the companies that have it dominate their market. And if you look at the big companies out there, whatever they are, they're all, most of them are benefiting from this network effect. So if you're a startup and you honestly do not believe you can be number one in your segment, you can be the very best, stop. Do something else. You need to make a change because if you are going for number two, if you think, oh, I'll be the second best, you probably won't survive. And even if you do survive, you're not going to be a great investment for venture capital because the winners in the market, let's take Google again versus the 19 other search engines, most of them don't exist. And, and the ones that sort of exist are limping along at a tiny, tiny fraction of the value of Google. Google is exponentially more than all the other 19 combined. I mean, way, there's no comparison. And this is true in almost every technology play. So when you're out there um, thinking about what you can do, at the very beginning, if you, if you can't see a path to being number one, just give it up. Start over. Do a restart. Do something else because you're wasting your time. Share future profits. So a lot of entrepreneurs come up to me and they tell they, they were like, Captain Hoff, Captain Hoff, uh, tell me, I, 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 need, I, I need to hire somebody, but I can't get great people. Or I need to do a deal with this partner, but I can't, I can't even afford to manufacture the product. How do I get over this hump? I need venture capital. Well, a lot of times the venture capital comes later. It doesn't come at the beginning. It doesn't come when you need it most because the venture capitalists, they, they're called venture capitalists, but they tend to be very conservative. They really uh, want uh, to invest in a sure thing. They don't want to lose their money. So they want to wait until you prove your model. Well, one way around this is what I call profit sharing. And it's not enough startups do this. At an early stage, uh, go to your partners 
your manufacturing partners, your distribution partners, maybe even your advertising partners, and see if there's a way to structure a deal where you can share the profits with them. How can you do that? So one way is you can share equity. You can give them an equity stake in your company. Another way is you can share the actual profits that you would make from selling the product. Um, you can also take this same strategy and use it for attracting employees. So maybe you can't pay employees at the beginning. Well, you can definitely give them equity. Um, that's one thing. But you can also, with your employees, you can give them profit sharing. So if you make a sale, then everybody gets some of the money. Like you can't pay them right now, but look, we're going to close this deal. We're going to get to the next milestone. And that money that comes in, I'm just, you know, we're going to all share in that. Really important technique for leveraging what you have to actually get to the next level before you can raise the capital you need. Okay, don't count on venture capital. Really important now. So a lot of entrepreneurs go into this thinking it's going to be easy to raise capital. You know, we're going to, it, it's going to be a no-brainer. Well, I'll tell you, it's almost never easy at the beginning. And especially when you need the money the most, it is the hardest thing. And it's really frustrating because a lot of times you will see other companies that don't even seem like they deserve to get funded, raising huge amounts of money. And you're like, what? Why are they raising 10, 20, $30 million? And I can't even raise $100,000. This isn't fair. Well, let me tell you, life isn't fair. It doesn't, you know, it isn't fair. And if you count on getting venture capital right away, you are in, you're going to be in for a rude surprise. Because most startups that I see, they don't raise much of anything for the first six months, sometimes for an entire year or longer. They have to struggle to actually get the proof into place to convince even the early investors to take a leap. And this, this is something that you must be prepared for. So if your business is super capital intensive at the beginning and you really cannot make much progress without raising venture capital, let me tell you one thing for sure. Do uh, pick a different business. Like, honestly, don't go down that path unless you're somebody who's already famous, who's, you know, done successful startups or has deep pockets or incredible connections to capital. Don't do a capital intensive business. The best startups, especially for first time entrepreneurs who are out to prove themselves, are startups that require very little capital. Almost all of it is sweat equity. So think of, uh, go, go down a path with your idea that requires your time and the time of your team, and you can make substantial progress. And all of you must be committed for the long haul. You know, you must have enough to live off of for a minimum of six months to a year. If you take this approach, your chance of success is, is exponentially higher than if you don't at the very beginning. Be honest with investors. So once you raise capital, once you get these investors in, um, it's really important to always share with them, honestly, the good and the bad. So from day one, from the first time you talk to investors to raise money, until your, you know, your entire relationship with those investors should be based on honesty. The truth always wins out. I will tell you, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, they, they try to sell something, they, they try to convince investors uh, with facts that are kind of dubious. Do not go down this path. First of all, you will border or actually commit fraud and you do not want to be in that, you do not want to be the next Theranos. So don't cross that line. Secondly, you don't need to be dishonest to convince investors to invest in your startup. They know that startups struggle. They know it's risky. They know that you will have problems. So you, it, by being honest at the beginning, you don't trap yourself. Don't inflate your numbers. Don't paint a rosy picture when, when you know there are real challenges ahead. If you want to succeed, the better thing to do 
It's to tell investors, this is a challenge coming up and then make them your partner. What do we do to get over this challenge? What can we do to uh, fight this problem together? See, by being honest with them, instead of being deceptive, like uh, painting a better picture than really exists, you are bringing them onto your team. You are asking them to work with you to find ways to overcome uh, these obstacles. And then they become your partners. It, it's, so, it's a much, much better relationship. Now, let me tell you a little story. There was an entrepreneur out there with a company and he, uh, at the very beginning, uh, he went to raise capital. He was trying to raise capital and his method for raising capital wasn't just to tell the investors the good thing, you know, what's great about my company, this, 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 and we're going to be so big and we're going to change the world and we're going to do all these things. That wasn't the entrepreneur strategy. The entrepreneur instead listed off the good things that they were doing and their goals, but then also spent a considerable amount of time telling the people who he wanted to convince to invest in his company, all the flaws with the company, all the challenges they had ahead, all the uncertainties and risks that they were going to incur. So the entrepreneur laid it out honestly. And you know what? The investors looked at him and said, this, you know, we, we don't get entrepreneurs with pitching us such an honest pitch. They gave the, the entrepreneur the money. Now, uh, so the entrepreneur raised a considerable amount of cash, grew the company, and as the entrepreneur was growing the company, at a certain point, the entrepreneur uh, realized that the company wasn't going to grow as big and fast as they had hoped. There were still a lot of problems they faced, and the entrepreneur started to go out and look for a buyer, which happens quite often. The entrepreneur went to Disney, and at Disney, Instead of trying to convince them that their company was great and, and everything was perfect, the entrepreneur did exactly the same thing, told them the pros of their business and the cons, honestly. And do you know what happened? Disney, they looked at them and they said, we almost never get somebody pitching us to acquire their company being so honest. We really appreciate this. And you, we think we can work with you to build a much bigger business by, by acquiring you. They acquired the company. Honesty does pay. I encourage you to take this approach. Time is money. A lot of entrepreneurs think my time is free, so they end up wasting a lot of time. They waste time chasing investors who aren't really serious about their business. I always say, if you're an entrepreneur, it's don't go after everybody who 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 you know, emails you or who says they're an angel investor or a venture capitalist, make sure they're the right fit for your company because your time is more valuable than their time. All they have to do every day is look at companies and decide if they want to invest. You have to build a business. You can't be raising money all the time. So you need to really maximize the, the time you invest into fundraising. Couple tips here. Don't try to raise money too early. If you don't have solid proof to back up your assumptions about your business, don't run around chasing investors. Go to investors when you have something to show them. Have some real demonstration of a product market fit. Have some customer validation, something that you can show them that they can say, wow, and extrapolate from this and say, this will be a big business. Number two, if an investor emails you and they want to uh, uh, meet you for coffee. Before you commit to that, find out if the investor is a real investor. I will tell you, I work with entrepreneurs all the time and they get investors approaching them that, that never uh, will invest. And it's really, it's, it's really uh, disturbing because some of these people are selling services. They may be a lawyer who just wants to get them to use their law firm and say, oh, we'll put in some money, but they never do. They may be somebody selling internet services or selling marketing services. And then they say, oh, we'll exchange our time for equity in your company. That's their investment. When what you really need is money. So qualify the leads. Before you go there, ask them how much they are going to invest, whether it will be cash or services and exchange that they're thinking of. What, how many companies have they invested in? And, and when was their last investment? 
You as an entrepreneur are entitled to ask these questions. And if they don't give you answers that are satisfying, like if they have never invested in a company, real cash, do not go meet with them. You are just wasting your time. So important to know. Do more with less. Now, I had, I've done a number of startups. And I always, at the beginning, when I first started with my first venture funded startup, I honestly believed that if we had a bigger team, we would do more. So as soon as I raised like 6.5 million in venture capital, I told my engineers, my head of engineering, hire up, hire more people. And we went from three engineers to 20 engineers. Now, this was a huge mistake because what it ended up doing was our three engineers who were really amazing and had done a huge amount of work, ended up spending all their time trying to train up these new engineers. And we hired so quickly that the quality of the engineers wasn't as good as it should have been. So they had to invest more time, which meant they couldn't actually get the core work done. And we actually were doing less with more. We had more money, we were spending more money, but we were getting less done than when we had three people. So my rule is only hire when you absolutely need to, especially when you don't have a lot of money, when you're at the early stages. Remember, for a big company with a thousand employees to hire a hundred new employees, that's 10% growth, right? They can manage that. But with you, with a small company of 10 people to hire five people, that's 50% growth. Like, that's like you're growing by 50%. So really, you, when you are uh, looking to hire people, hire gradually and be very selective and do more with the team you have as long as possible. Don't think that more people will change the equation. It's the quality of people, not the number of people that makes the difference. Should you stick to your plan? This is something that's really important to know. And the answer is simple. No, <laughs> you should not stick to your plan. Not if you are getting evidence that your plan is not working. So for most startups at an early stage, it's not a straight line. It's not a linear go from point A to point B to point C and you will be successful. Most startups at the beginning, it's erratic. They're going all over the place to try to figure things out. And literally at the very beginning of your startup, you should be changing your plan every week. I mean, you don't have to, they might not be big changes. They might be subtle changes, but you should be looking at your plan and saying, look, with everything we're learning, with every, with every new piece of data we're gathering, are we on the right path? Or should we subtly adjust or radically shift our direction to something that we are seeing would yield a bigger opportunity? Then as you start to grow, the, the, you can make longer and longer term plans. You know, eventually, you know, when you're sort of still at the early stage, but you have a good idea of what you're doing, you should still be reviewing your plan every month to make sure that what you're doing is actually going to produce the results you think it will. And even when you're a big company, honestly, I've seen companies that have raised tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. They're growing really fast, but um, all of a sudden they hit a speed bump and because the markets are always changing, customers' behavior is changing. There are new trends on the line. New competitors pop up out of nowhere. You always have to be going back and saying, wow, we assumed all these things to be true, but are they still true? And if they aren't, you better be rewriting that plan. Try something different. So um, I will tell you, there are really only two ways to succeed in the world. Two ways, two ways. One is that you do something exponentially better than anybody else, all the competitors. Like you, uh, you're, you're so much better that, you, that all the customers have to come to you. If you can't be exponentially better, you have to do something different. You have to do something new. You have to do something people haven't seen re before. Get, discover a new way of creating value for customers in an area that they desperately need help that none of the existing solutions are providing. That is where you win. If you can't do one of these two things, you won't have a huge startup. I guarantee it. Tech won't save you. I like to say technology is really important, 
but technology will not make your company. You can have the best technology in the world and your company can go nowhere. Really, it's not the technology that matters. It's what that technology can do for the customer that matters. Your job is not as a tech company, isn't to create tech, it's to create value. You need to create value for your customers. At the end of the day, if technology, I don't care if you put uh, one month into building this technology, one year or 10 years into building this technology. If you can't figure out a way for this technology to create value for somebody, extreme value where they, will, they really, really need it and they really will pay for it, then forget it. You do not have a business. You know, most of the great startups out there, they don't start developing a lot of tech. They, they, a lot of times they just use off the shelf technology. Why is this? Because developing tech takes a long time. And at the end of the day, it's only useful if, it's, if, if, if your customer finds it useful. If your customer doesn't find it useful, doesn't matter, right? Investors may think it's great, but at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't do anything for your company. Tech won't save you. Discover demand. I like to say the entrepreneur's job is not to build a product. It's not to create technology. It's not to do anything else to market yourself, to raise venture capital. The number one job of an entrepreneur is to figure out where there's hidden demand, demand that nobody else has tapped. It's like you're an oil wildcatter. You're out there drilling wells, looking for a gusher. The gusher is demand because demand is what drives business. Pent up demand that nobody else has discovered that explodes will power your company from a tiny company into a big business. So when you're out there, before you build your product, before you even think of like, you know, nail down your idea, before you do anything, go out into the world and start looking for demand. Demand will drive everything. As a venture capitalist, I care about the demand more than anything. If you discover demand and you can bring together the right people and the right technology to meet that demand, you have a winner. Customers have the answer. Whenever you're confused, whenever you're lost, whenever you feel like, I don't know what to do next, my business is stagnating or my, my numbers are going down. Go to your customers, ask them. They are a wealth of ideas. They may not tell you the type of innovation to do or the type of product to build, but they can tell you the outcome they want, what they need. And then you can figure out what to build to satisfy that need. That is the key to launching a great startup. That is the key to getting out of the doldrums. You can do this at any time. So if you feel like you're Sisyphus pushing a boulder up a hill only to have it roll back on you, go ask your customers. They can put you on a new path so you don't wind up torturing yourself forever. Perseverance, number one trait of great entrepreneurs. Be, stick with it. Like it's going to be hard. You're gonna to have to be flexible. You're gonna to have to reevaluate your ideas, but stick with it. You only fail when you give up, that's when you fail. If you don't give up, you haven't failed. So remember that nobody can defeat you, but you. And nearing the end of my talk, I want to say the yin and the yang. Life is, is a composition of opposites, of light and dark, good and bad, you know, success and failure. If you want to succeed in life, you have to accept failure. If you want to uh, prosper in life, you have to accept, accept that there's going to be hardship along the way. Things are never perfect. There's always something, something going wrong when you have a startup. There's always some challenge or some headache. Take it as a whole. If you could take it as a whole, you can actually gain perspective, not get stressed out, and do a better job at leading your company forward. And lastly, life is an adventure. So treat life as an adventure, treat it as fun. I, when I do startups, it's fun, right? Like I know there's gonna be hardships. I know there's gonna be headaches. I know I'm gonna feel some pain, but that's what great adventurers do. Look at the people who like climb Mount Everest or go to the North Pole or the South Pole or, or go or fly to the moon. They're all taking risks. They're all uh, having to put up with hardship, but it's an adventure. And you are on this adventure. You chose to be on this adventure. So enjoy the experience. 
So I hope you, you enjoyed this talk. If you want to reach out to me, just go to Founderspace. So you can contact me. We have a contact page. If you put my name in the email you send, it'll get forwarded to me. We love to engage with entrepreneurs. If you want to submit your business plan, you can go to Founderspace. If you want to join us, we're on literally every social network, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, you name it, just search for Founderspace. And if you want to get my books, they're on Amazon and every other bookstore, or you can come to Founderspace and you can find out all about them there, as well as a lot more videos and, and really good educational material to help you succeed. Thank you so much. Yeah, Captain Hoff, I am really, really speechless. Uh, very interesting, very informative, very inspiring presentation. Uh, if Thank I, you. If, if I could humbly say, I mean, you, you are the definition of a leading entrepreneur. We want to learn from you. I really have no words. Really, really incredible advice. Uh, Thank you. The, the Startup Survival Guide you shared with us, and of course, the book, based on the book, Surviving a Startup, should be every entrepreneur's guidebook and manual. And uh, as you said, entrepreneurship is not for everybody. Uh, both perseverance and high pain tolerance should be key attributes one needs to have to embark on an entrepreneurial journey. And you spoke about all key areas and focus areas, clearly understanding the issue, listening to your customer, asking for help, reaching out to people, seeing your business through other people's eyes, making sure you have good, talented people by, by your side, and that time is money. And uh, as you said, only the best survive. Uh, so your advice is really, really incredible and uh, will make us all better. And the fundraising process and the approach with investors, you really made us wiser. Th thank you very much, re uh, incredibly. Thank you. Thank uh, you. If, if, I, if I could ask you a question, if I might, mm -hmm. on, top of, on, to on top of all the other, you know, normal challenges that a startup is faced with, you know, this past year, we have also been dealing with a global pandemic. Would you be able to share some thoughts and insights based on what you've seen happening during the time period uh, in, in relation to this experience? Sure. So the pandemic has actually been a boon for a lot of startups. You know, technology companies have done incredibly well. Um, there are a few sectors that have been really hurt. Like if you're dealing with retailers, if you're dealing with travel, you know, there's certain areas that have been really tough. So for some startups, it's been difficult. But for the majority of startups, it has been a uh, I couldn't have been a better time. There's more capital than ever available. Um, companies are growing very fast. Companies are employing new technology. And I see this continuing. I mean, we're not, uh, the markets always change. We can have up and down markets in the future. You never know. But right now, uh, if you're in Silicon Valley, you're in New York, you're in a major startup hub, uh, the ability to raise capital, uh, it has almost never been a better time. Like valuations are very, very high. Um, so the pandemic hasn't really hurt most startup founders who are outside, you know, a few of the, you know, more traditional sectors that have been slammed. And in those cases, I have advice for them. If you're an entrepreneur and your business wasn't doing well before the pandemic, it probably is not going to do well after the pandemic. So you better rethink your idea. Don't think that the end of the pandemic will change everything. Um, and if you're uh, in the most important thing for entrepreneurs is always be innovating on your business. Always be looking for new opportunity. Never be satisfied with what you have right now. And I will tell you, the pandemic brought up in a number of opportunities for entrepreneurs, you know, telemedicine, things like that just took off like crazy during the pandemic. Those will cool down a little. You know, ed tech took off huge amounts of money and in capital invested in remote learning and, and areas like that. Those will cool down a bit. You can't expect there to be the same level of excitement, you know, now that we're coming out of the pandemic as when we were in the midst of it. Um, however, there are still opportunities and there'll be new opportunities. And that's the exciting thing. And you have to keep your eyes open for those. Absolutely. And um, uh, I do agree with uh, these points you're making right now. And thank you so much for uh, sharing these. One, one more question, if I might, and especially since you've done it so successfully. It's easier than ever before, you know, for high growth entrepreneurs to expand globally into different geographic territories. And it looks like you and your team at Founder Space have done an incredible job expanding internationally and successfully maintaining a footprint in so many countries all around the world. And also advising other companies that you're involved with on how to do that. 
would, would you be able to share a few thoughts as to the steps one should follow to successfully establish an international presence? What do you feel that basic infrastructure should be for someone to confidently expand? If you could share some thoughts. So for us, when we expand internationally, we don't do it alone. So we always do it with local partners in the country. And our job isn't to do everything ourselves, because honestly, overseas is really tough. Like when we enter China, it's a totally different market. There's a huge learning curve. Um, we're not Chinese. Uh, so we really uh, took it baby steps at first. And I advise anybody else to don't just jump in with a lot of money. You'll probably end up blowing it <laughs> because you don't know what you're doing. So take very small steps, form really close relationships, make sure that you find the right partners who are honest, uh, trustworthy, and then uh, do it incrementally build your business with them. Uh, try something small together so that you can test the relationship, so you can learn who they are and what they're capable of doing. And, and if that works out, build upon that. That's the best way. Forming relationships, really key. So we work in so many countries because we don't do it all ourselves. Like we are always looking for local partners on the ground who already have incubators, accelerators, government funded projects, things like that and then we participate with them. So what we offer them is what we do really best, which is my teaching, like and the instructors we have, our teaching, our courses, things like that. Um, but we uh, let them do what they do best, which is run the operation on the ground um, because they're there, they, they speak the language, they know the culture, they have the people, that's what they do. So that has been our strategy. And when helping startups, what we try to do is hook them up with other local partners. So if they need distribution of their product there, are there good distribution partners? And because we have local partners there who know the ecosystem, who have business relationships for their entire lives there, they are, you know, we work with our local partners and the startups, the three of us, to help make sure that the startups that come to us get the best outcome. And I could talk, do a whole nother talk on this, but I'll stop there. So let's plan for another talk to discuss about global expansion. Yeah. Definitely partnerships, super, super key. And uh, in so many industries and, you know, for so many, many industries, global access, global distribution is definitely important. So strategic partnerships are, are definitely key. Uh, Captain Hoff, thank you very much once again for your time, your presentation. Yeah, as part of the Leading Entrepreneurs of the World series, you have achieved great success in so many different fields. And we're all excited to continue observing and admiring everything you do and being inspired by you and your advice, your mentorship, your guidance. Thank you and talk to you again soon. Thank you, Stelios. It's been wonderful collaborating with you. Thank you, uh, Captain Hope. A great honor. Thank you. Talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Thank you. <laughs> Take care.